Good morning, everyone. My name is Holly Ruser. I'm a National Product Manager here at Graybar. I'd like to welcome you to Graybar's G2 Talk presentation on 40G-based T, Strategies for a Simple Network Migration. This talk is part of a webinar series we offer each month for our data communication customers. We have a great discussion lined up today, but before we get started, I'd like to cover just a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you were one of the first 50 people who joined in on this presentation today, you will receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee courtesy of Graybar as a thank you for your time today. Also, if you notice at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for questions and answers. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. and We're going to address just as many of those questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. Lastly, our G2 Talks are all archived on the graybar.com website. So you'll be able to view the presentation again or share it with friends. We're happy to team up today with Leviton Network Solutions. As a data communications distributor, Graybar works alongside Leviton to provide a broad selection of solutions to ensure that your data center infrastructure needs are met. You can visit graybar.com to learn more about our solutions. At this time, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Mark Deering. Mark is a senior product manager with Leviton Network Solutions, and he's been with Leviton almost 10 years. He has extensive experience in product development and design, and he's responsible for much of the advanced technology products including Shielded Category Solutions, the Intelligent Infrastructure Solutions, and the new Category 8 developments. Mark also represents Levitson on the TIA Standards Development Committee. So without further delay, I would like to turn the presentation over to Mark. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, Holly. Happy to be here today. This webinar covers four primary sections. We're going to talk first about some of the next generation copper standards that are driving development in the marketplace. Then we're going to take a deeper dive into base T in the data center. We're going to take a second stop at enterprise standards, how some of the new standards are influencing how people are implementing their cabling out in the enterprise. And then just a short discussion about some of the products that Leviton has to support your network migration. So looking at some of the technology drivers that are causing us to need higher bandwidth cabling, uh, the first thing we want to remind people of is layer one is the foundation of the data center. It's only 3% of the IT budget, but it affects all of the IT investment. If you don't have a strong performing cabling system, your extremely expensive switches, servers, and other active hardware are not going to perform at their peak efficiency. So it's very important to make sure that you maximize your layer one infrastructure. What's driving the new technologies? First of all, cloud services. More and more of our data is being run from either cloud-based or remote data centers. So you're having a lot more data traffic running over the wires as opposed to the local processors at your desks or at your PC. You're also seeing a lot of convergence. In addition to your IT networks, you're seeing security, building automation, cameras, wireless access points, door access security systems. All sorts of devices are running over the IT network that you didn't see as, you know, five, ten years ago. So you're seeing a lot more stress on your cabling because of the extra equipment that's being used. Uh, virtualization, again, this relates back to your remote data centers. The more virtual machines you have, the more network traffic you have within switches and the servers and the network infrastructure. You're starting to see more multi-gigabit switches out in the premise. So as you have a migration from, say, 1G to 10G out in your telecom closet, that's going to cause more data traffic that's going to be seen in the data center uh, where everything aggregates. And then you've got decisions that designers have to make in terms of top of rack, end of row, middle of row. Your different switch uh, topologies and how you place things within your data center is going to have an impact on what type of cabling you use. Looking at infrastructure trends from uh, a design standpoint, this chart shows cloud server deployment. Uh, and when we say cloud, you can think of this as data center. 
as opposed to the enterprise. So as, as early as 2008, it was primarily one gig in your data center with a little bit of 10 gig. Looking ahead to 2017, 18, 19, 20, you're seeing a predominant use of 10 gig with some 40, 25, and higher data ports. So anything higher than 40G is going to be fiber, but what we can see is a clear trend towards the higher bandwidth speed in the data center looking at 25 and 40 gig. Conversely, if we look at the premise server deployment, and you can primarily think about this as your switches and servers that are in your telecom closet, there's still a, a predominant use of 1G ports in there. But when you start to look at 2017, 18, and 19, you're going to start to see a pretty significant shift towards the 10G ports out in the telecom closet. And this is going to impact the type of cabling we want to be putting in place uh, in our, throughout our building. Another way of looking at it is the server deployment by the application. So in 2008, it was predominantly in the enterprise. But as you look at the projections in 2018, it's going to be half and half, enterprise and cloud. So this really speaks to the fact that where we used to have a lot of our processing power local, we're actually making more use of the remote data centers, the cloud-based data centers, to handle all of our processing and data needs. From a port migration standpoint, there's a difference between switch-to-switch -switch ports and switch-to-server. If you think about the switch-to-switch -switch ports, this is where a lot of the data is aggregated and shared across the various parts of the data center. So as more and more data feed into the switches, you need to have the bigger pipe. And that's why you're starting to see the 1G and 10G migration start to shift over, people migrating from 10G looking to 40G to handle that increased bandwidth as you aggregate out from the endpoint. Now, switch to server ports are going to stay primarily 10G and 1G in the near future. But as you can see, we're, we're starting to see a trickle-down effect where uh, some people are going to start to adopt the 40G switch to server ports. And a lot of that is just going to depend on who the end user is, the application, what type of data and, and size of data they're trying to transmit. Looking at the copper standards, this slide shows the trends from 1990, uh, basically you know, a 30-year period. Starting in 1990, we had CAT3. And there has been a fairly standardized process of every five years, you get an increase in category rating. So 1995 was CAT5. Around 2000, we had 5E. Then uh, 5E and 6 for 1,000 base T. Looking at 2005, that was when CAT 6A and the 10G base T really hit its stride. Then you'll notice that there was about a 10-year period without a new standard. And one of the reasons is the challenges of trying to put more than 10G over copper twisted pair. But one of the things you'll also notice is that ISO and TIA have split out, and they're looking at four different standards. 40G and 25G for CAT8, and we're also going to talk about 2.5 and 5G over CAT5 e and 6. And there's very specific applications for these different standards, and I'll explain later on why we're looking at these various different standards. So with CAT8, uh, this is the new standard that ISO and TIA have been working on to support 40G base T over twisted pair. Up till now, if you're going to get 40G, it had to be over fiber. But for a variety of reasons, uh, cost and backwards compatibility and migration standards, uh, there's been a big interest in trying to get higher speeds over copper twisted pair. All of the conversations that we've been having over the last five years have been how to migrate your system from 1G to 10G. And it's been a fairly simple process or straightforward process. You're going from CAT5E and CAT6 over 1G, frequencies of 100 and 250 megahertz, but it's been the standard 
100 meter four connector channels that we've been used to since Cat 5e came out. And 10G, it's the only difference really is that it's running at a 500 megahertz. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of the design challenges that manufacturers have had to uh, circumnavigate in order to deal with the 500 megahertz. That's when we had alien crosstalk issues, um, the separation in the larger diameter cables that eventually came down to smaller cables. All of these things that manufacturers have been able to accomplish in order to get 10G over twisted pair. Um, both of these solutions are available for both UTP and shielded. Conversely, when we start to talk about CAT8 and 40G base T, one of the significant changes is that this is only going to be a shielded solution. For a variety of reasons, the, the UTP cabling won't be able to handle the 40G bandwidth. Uh, looking at the right of the chart, we're looking at migrations from 10G over to 40G. So a couple of key differences here. Uh, I mentioned that it's shielded only. It's also going to be running at 2 gigahertz. So that's a pretty significant jump from the 500 megahertz, and that's one of the primary reasons why shielded cabling is necessary. I also want to point out that there is a pretty significant distance limitation for CAT8. It's limited to 30 meters and only two connectors in the channel. On the left side of the chart, we're looking at migrations from 1G. There's a couple of new options available. And the, the driver behind this are people are interested in getting more out of their existing installations of CAT5E and CAT6. So IEEE and TIA are investigating standards that would allow people to use their installed CAT5E or 6 cabling, but get more than 1G out of it simply by replacing the active equipment. This is a very early stage investigation. The desire is to maintain the 100 meter four connector channel, but a lot of testing is still ha needs to occur in order to prove that that works. One option that may come to play is we may have to limit the distance in order to achieve those data rates. So instead of 100 meters, it may be 50 meters, 60 meters, 75 meters. We're really not sure where it is. But the goal is to try and maintain the same four connector 100 meter channel if we can but this will allow people to try and improve their bandwidth and their data rates without having to recable entirely. So for CAT8, here's a picture of what the system topology looks like. I mentioned that it's limited to the two connectors and a 30 meter channel. So the maximum length channel would be 24 meters between the jacks and three meter patch cords on each end. You'll notice that this is an interconnect topology, which means that you can have a jack-to-jack a -jack trunk between two panels, but then you have patch cords on either end that go directly into the equipment. So with the CAT8 standard, there's no provision for a cross-connect topology. And that's one of the reasons why we're really not talking about using CAT8 out in the enterprise. Uh, for one reason, it's, it's a distance limitation, but for another, it doesn't allow the true structured cabling topology that a lot of people would implement. One question we get is, how did you get 30 meter limitation? Well, a survey was conducted, and what we found is 80% of the switch to server length in the data centers are 30 meters and under. So in this way, we were able to design a shielded, UT, a shielded twisted pair system that would be deployed in the data center and hit 80% of the application. So anything over 30 meters will still have to use the fiber links that are already in play. So looking at the actual Category 8 standard, there's two different classes that are in play, and the connectors are different. Class 1, sometimes referred to as CAT 8.1, is the standard RJ45 interface. This is going to be adopted into the current TIA and ISO standards for CAT8. Globally recognized and adopted, this is backwards compatible 
So you can install a CAD8 cabling system and still run 10G systems over it if you're not ready to upgrade your active equipment. Standards bodies approved, robust, time tested. It still allows you to handle power over Ethernet, PoE Plus, and then the new four pair PoE. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The second class, class two, is a non RJ. And we call it non RJ because there really isn't a firm name for it. Some of you may be familiar with some of the products that are shown on the slide for CAT7. And, and even though TIA doesn't recognize a CAT7, you'll see these sometimes outside of the US, Europe, Middle East, South America. Uh, one of the key differences between a class one and a class two connector is the placement of the pin. Whereas a standard RJ45 has all eight pins in a row on one side, if you look at the, the plug that's referenced as a GG45, you'll notice that the pins are spread out into the four corners. This is one of the ways that they're able to achieve the performance required for class two is because they're separating and providing more space in between the different pairs on the plug and the connector. And this is one of the reasons why it's not backwards compatible with RJ45. Some of the challenges that we anticipate with class two, it's not gonna be fully backwards compatible. You're gonna require hybrid cables if you're going to try and run class two cabling with traditional piece of active equipment. The class two connectors aren't available on active equipment today. It's currently only recognized in the ISO IEC standard. CIA, when they released the draft in Q1 of 2016, is only gonna recognize the class one connector. And there has been limited market adoption historically from a CAT7 and 7A solution uh, that has been on the market for a while. So these are some of the hurdles that we anticipate um, the market seeing when the class two connectors are available. The third option from a connectivity standpoint that's often used for copper cabling in the data center is the called a direct attach cable, sometimes referenced as DAC. You may hear heard of it as either an SFP, SFP plus, which offer the, the 1G and 10G, and then there's also a 40G option, which is the QSFP plus, and really it stands for quad SFP. So similar to uh, some of the, the fiber links, it, it looks very similar in terms of the interface into the switches and the servers, but instead of a fiber adapter or uh, a converter to uh, an LC or some sort of connector, it's actually a directly attached and, and soldered connection inside there. This is an intelligent cable. There's a microprocessor and a circuit board inside of there. Uh, it is not considered structured cabling because you're directly connecting your switch to your server without any type of interconnect in between. Some of the challenges that you run into from a design standpoint is uh, the 1G and 10G be limited to seven meters. The 40G could get up to 15 meters, but that's still a fairly significant limitation. If you remember, 80% of the switch to server connections run from uh, up to 30 meters. So beyond 15 meters, there's really not a good option for the direct attach cable. And that's one of the advantages for using CAT8 systems in the data center if you want to be able to go beyond the 15 meters. And that has a big influence on your topology and your architecture. So there's a couple of different applications that are being used in the data center. You can have a dedicated network row. And then we've got these three types of topologies that many of you may be familiar with, the middle of row, the end of row, and the top of rack. My next slide has a little bit better understanding of where that is. Very similar, you know, what the name says, the end of row, simply put all of your switches in the end of the row and then you cable them all the way out to the different servers in cabinets throughout that row. 
depending on how many cabinets you have, you could quickly exceed that 15 or 7 meter limitation. So the end of row topology is a good application for CAD 8, whereas if you're using the direct attached cable, you may be forced into a middle of row topology simply because you don't have the reach to span the entire row. So you put your switches and servers, put your switches rather in the middle of the row, and then you have to run cables both to the right and to the left in order to reach your servers. Then, of course, top of rack, when you put your switch in the top of the rack and then have all the servers down below, you don't have the distance limitations, but that's when you run into some inefficiencies in terms of port utilization. Uh, for example, if you have a 48-port switch in the top of the rack, but then you have 49 server connections down below, all of a sudden you have to introduce a second switch that you only use one port in. Whereas if you have a middle of row or an end of row topology, you can max out use of your switch ports because you're supporting more than just one cabinet. Some of the applications that are, would be used for CAD8, certainly in the access labor, your server to switch connections, it's a more cost effective replacement and an alternative to the SFP Plus. Uh, you can look at power over Ethernet, supporting uh, PoE up to 100 watts. CAD8 cabling is going to have a larger conductor size, 22 gauge conductor, as opposed to a 23 or 24 gauge, so that's going to improve performance from a PoE standpoint. Uh, 802.11ax, WAPs that are going to be supporting greater than 10G, that's where you might use CAD8. HD base T, that's an emerging trend where you're starting to see more AV signals over category cabling. Uncompressed 4K video, again, on the AV side. And then, of course, there is a big movement towards putting distributed antenna systems in buildings. That's something that will be supported by category cabling. So to summarize the CAT8 and the migration, 25 g base t is, is a fast-track investigation that's underway. So primarily CAT8 has been focused on 40 g base t but one of the things that IEEE has been working on is a new standard for 25 g base t Both 40 and 25 g is going to use CAT8. So from an infrastructure standpoint, it doesn't really matter. If you're going to go beyond 10G, you would put in a CAD8 cabling system. However, the 25G base T is going to provide customers with a lower cost option to migrating higher than 10G because the, the next generation switches and servers, they're going to be here faster than the 40G solution and they're going to be less expensive. So the nice thing about it is if somebody wants to migrate from 10G to 25G, they would put in a CAD8 system and then they wouldn't have to do anything to the infrastructure if they want to jump from 25 to 40. They would just simply upgrade their equipment. Let's look at how some of the standards are driving the designs in the enterprise. So POE is a big topic. And you might hear several people say, well, fiber is the future, fiber is the future, copper is on the downward trend. Well, power over Ethernet is the one thing that's going to keep the copper cabling systems in force for a long time. If we look at some of the history, in 2002, IEEE's 802.3AF introduced the concept of power over Ethernet. It offered 15.4 watts over the two pairs. Then in 2009, they updated the standard 802.3AT, in which case they introduced a new type of device that could handle up to 30 watts. Sometimes this is called PoE Plus. So with the introduction of the 802.3AT standard, they had to introduce a new concept of uh, type of PoE. So instead of uh, just having the 15.4, now they have the 30 watts, and you have to specify what your power device type is so that either the switch or the mid-span knows how much power to provide to the device, whether it is a camera or an RFID reader or, or other type of device. So 15.4 is type 1, 30 watts is type 2. And then in 2011, 
you're starting to see the need for even more power, and that's when Cisco developed a proprietary protocol over the four pairs of the cabling. It was called UPOE. It's not a standards-based solution. It's just something proprietary that Cisco was driving with their technology. But what we have found is IEEE recognized the need, and they're working on a draft right now, 802.3BT, which will eventually replace 802.3AT, and that standard is going to recognize four types of powered devices. Type 1, 15.4. Type 2 is 30 watts. Type 3 will be the 60 watts using all four pairs, and that's going to mimic what Cisco had. And then the big news right now is type 4, which is 100 watts of power over the four-pair POE. This is a pretty significant step for two reasons. Number one, the standard very clearly limits the power to 100 watts or less. And the reason for that is because NEC code talks about the fact that if you're going to have a low voltage system, it can't exceed 100 watts. So we want to make sure that POE standards don't require different licensing and different uh, types of certifications to install it. And then the second thing is 100 watts is a lot of power. Imagine the ability to power a television over your Ethernet cable. That's a pretty significant advantage. And one of the things that you'll notice is if, if you can power a laptop over the Ethernet cable, all of a sudden people are going to want to have Ethernet connections all over the place and not simply just the wireless connection. So these are some exciting things that are going to allow uh, copper cabling systems to stick around for a long time. One thing we have to worry about when you're running power over the cabling is temperature rise. So more power and data means higher temperature cables and speeds. So one thing that TIA and, and IEEE are doing is looking at the bundle sizes. So the chart to the right is an example of if you had a 15 degree temperature delta one of the things that we're trying to do is assume a ambient temperature of 45 degrees Celsius and typical cable ratings for category cable is 60 degrees. So that basically gives us 15 degrees of temperature rise before we exceed the cable rating. And as you can see, Cat5e cables, you can get 52 cables together before you hit that temperature. For Cat6, you can get 64. But then for 6A and CAT8, you can get a lot more cables bundled together in your cable tray before you start to exceed or get real close to that maximum temperature. And one of the reasons for that is the larger conductor size, the 23 and 22 gauge solid conductors that are inside those cables. So the takeaway for this is CAT6A should be the minimum cable that you pull for new installation if you want to run PoE over it, and for, for both data rates as well as thermal management. So again, these are some of the reasons why 6A offers some advantages. The 23 conductor cable over the 24, uh, lower cost supported by the higher power per cable. Uh, one of the challenges that you're going to run into, of course, with the lower uh, the smaller number, uh, smaller conductor size, a 24 gauge cable, you're going to lose most of your, a good chunk of your power in thermal dissipation, so it's not very efficient. If you're going to send power from the source to the device, wouldn't you want most of that power to be used by the device rather than warming up your pathways? So that's another advantage for 6A. Now, some people who are Bixi trained may start to wonder, well, everything we talk about power and data, you want to maintain this separation between them. But one thing to keep in mind, obviously, whenever you put power and data close together, whether it's DC or AC, uh, you could potentially see some performance drop. But we want to keep in mind that PoE is a DC-powered solution. And, and the maximum for the 100-watt PoE is 52 volts DC at one amp. So 
data transmits over AC frequencies, so 6A is 500 megahertz, 250, 5E is 100 megahertz. So with DC, the frequency is zero. So the takeaway for this is there really should not be any concerns about running power over the same cabling as the data. And these are some of the things that the TIA standard, uh, TSB 184, is going to be coming out with and saying, we've done the test, you can run PoE over these cables under these conditions, and you'll still maintain compliance with the category standard. I want to point out that uh, the Atlas X1, the new connector platform that Leviton launched earlier this year, has been tested to deliver the 100 watts of power. Uh, for the draft standard, 802.11dt. So this is something that you can probably expect to see from other manufacturers in the future. One of the things that we want to talk about is we know that in roughly 2017, we're going to have the, the new BT standard. You may not have devices that need 100 watts of power now, but if you're going to pull new cabling and put new systems in, you want to know that what you put in today is going to be able to support the standards that are coming going to be introduced in the next three to five years. So recommendations for POE. It's all about CAT 6A. If you're going to pull new cabling, pull CAT 6A. It's going to be able to support the 15, 30, 60, and the 100 watts. So the other application that's driving cabling selection in the enterprise is wireless. So Everybody talks about how wireless is going to kill copper because all the connections are going to be dropped. Well, that's not necessarily true. One of the things that you'll notice is that instead of having a data connector in the wall, those connections are actually going to move above the ceiling. So instead of directly connecting your computer, a wireless access point is what's going to be connected. All of those still need to have copper cabling out into the premise area. So this chart shows uh, the migration if you will, of the tape 802.11 standard. Uh, most of us started out with the 802.11G access points in our homes. Then we're several, you know, several people are starting to move to the 802.11N on the consumer side. But the primary standards that are affecting the commercial applications are the AD and the AC standard. AD we really don't focus on too much because that is limited to a single room, and there's not many applications for that. Most people want to be able to put in a wireless access point and know that it's going to be able to transmit through the walls and try and get as much coverage as it can. So right now, the top of the line access points that are available on the market are 802.11ac wave one. You'll often find these because they've got the eight connections for the antennas. Uh, one of the ways that people are able to achieve higher data rates is it's, it's different lanes. So it's multiple in, multiple out type of uh, communication. Uh, it operates at 5 gigahertz, and it can offer 1.3 gig per second. This was a very significant step because for the first time, you can actually get wireless data rates that are higher than CAT6. That's one of the big turning points that starting to see a lot more people use wireless instead of wired connections. And then with Wave 2, because of some of the newer technology, you're going to be able to see it get 6.9 gigs. Not quite the 10G speeds that we want to get to, but it's a significant improvement over the Wave 1. And we're just starting to see some of the manufacturers introduce access points for this system. One thing I do want to point out, the range. When you jump from 802.11n from 30 or 70 meters, you cut the distance in half when you go to AC. You can think about that as I've just doubled the number of access points that I need to put into my building in order to have the same coverage. That's a very important aspect to keep in mind when you're designing for wireless access points. The new emerging wireless standard, 802.11ax, the goal is to have 14 gigabits. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to have some uh, 
some throughput that's going to exceed even the CAT 6A capabilities. That's something that we're going to keep our eye on and understand how that's going to come into play from a, a cabling system. So this is where the 2.5G and 5G standards come into play. So the idea behind this is if you have an existing CAT 5E cabling system that's rated for 1G, but you want to try and put in some active equipment and WAPs that can handle the 2.5G, that way you don't have to pull new cabling. Same thing with CAT 6. Wouldn't it be great if uh, when those Wave 2 AC access points come into play, even though you wouldn't be able to get the full 6 gigabit of data rates from the active equipment, if you could put those onto CAT 6 and get at least 5G out of it, that would be a significant improvement for minimal installation costs, only having to replace the active equipment. So the one thing that I want to make sure that people understand is very similar to the old TSB 155, where you were trying to get 10G throughputs over CAT6 installed cabling, this standard is intended for existing installed cabling. We don't want people to try and reference these new standards and say, well, I'm going to pull new cabling. I'm going to save money by putting CAT6 cabling in and then run the 5G. Very clearly targeted for current installations. If you're going to pull any new cable, it should be CAT 6A. So laying out your wireless access point grid, TIA has a TSB 162A that talks about this grid approach. And what you can think about it is it's a it's a 60 foot square grid. Take your building, put it into these grids, and you apply a connect excuse me apply a connector directly into the center. And the idea is that when the connection right in the center of that grid, you have the flexibility with the appropriate length patch cord to place the access point anywhere within that grid to optimize your coverage. That works well for 802.11n. For 802.11ac, the recommendation is to put two CAT6A cables directly in the center. One of the reasons for that is uh, if you recall, I said the range is only 35 meters as opposed to the 70 meters that's available for the N. So in order to have the appropriate coverage, there's very high likelihood that you're going to have to put two access points somewhere within that grid to maintain that coverage. So if you're going to be implementing uh, 802.11N access points right now, if you're going to pull cabling, go ahead and pull two connectors. So that way, all you have to do is, if you're going to upgrade your active equipment, cabling is already in place. All you have to do is get a couple of patch cords. So when we're talking about putting wireless access points either on the ceiling grid or up in the ceiling, we need to make sure that we are thinking about the plenum requirement. Now, many, many applications have the cabling up above the ceiling, which is not a plenum situation. It may have ducted air return. But if it is an air plenum, we need to make sure that the products that are up above that ceiling are rated appropriately. One of the things that is, has been a, a very a popular topology has been directly crimping a cable onto the end of a, a horizontal cable and just plugging it directly into the device, whether it's a wireless access point or a camera. One of the challenges that you're going to see in the next several years is as people migrate to CAT 6A cabling, there's not as many options available for a true Category 6A field terminated plug. And what options are available are rather big. You may see them as, as the long metal bodied plugs, and those are not going to be 100% compatible with all of your different devices. You got to be very careful which access point, which camera, which time clock, whatever you use. Make sure that that extra long plug is going to be capable. So one of the things that Leviton has introduced this year are different options that allow you to do the standards permanent link for these type of uh, permanently attached devices. And one of them that we're showing here is it's a, a clip 
that has a surface mount box that goes above the ceiling and allows you to have your LAN cable terminate directly into a jack, and then you can use a patch cord to connect to the WAP or the camera or things of that nature. A couple of benefits with the permanent link is you, you get to do your test, you can warranty it, you can certify it, and you can have all of the cabling system in place before the active equipment even comes on board. And it's really useful from a separation of trades. So if, if one set of contractors is going to do the cabling, they can have all the paperwork that shows that their job is finished, they can get off site, and then later on when the active equipment shows up, if there's any problems, it makes sorting out the issues a lot easier. So one of the things that we recommend is if you're going to use any of these products in a plenum space is you want to have an end-to-end -end solution. So you want to make sure that the surface mount boxes, the patch cords, the jacks, and the cable, of course, is all rated for plenum. It's kind of a hit or miss as far as whether the fire marshal or the AHJ is going to call you on it, but it'd be great to kind of finish that up and make sure that you're not going to run into any trouble. So a couple of products that Leviton has that would assist you in your migration. One of the big things is the Atlas X1 connector. Brand new platform Leviton introduced. This is uh, a platform that was designed to handle Cat5e 6 and 6a UTP, and then you're going to see Cat5e shielded, Cat6 shielded, 6a shielded, and then the new uh, Leviton Cat8 shielded connector is all going to be based on this platform. I uh, mentioned that uh, the, the same connector is plenum rated, it's 100 watt POE tested, and then of course one of the nice things when you're talking about migration in your data center is the cassette based solutions, and our E2X HD system is available for both copper and fiber, high density patching that would allow you to easily migrate from one connectivity. So to summarize, copper structure cabling is going to be around a while. It will meet the needs of tomorrow, both for the enterprise and in the data center. We're going to have 25G and 40G data rates over CAD8 to support a variety of existing and emerging topologies. Uh, the CAD8 system will be higher density, increased flexibility, familiar installation, it's a reasonable reach and reliability compared to the direct attached cable. And then uh, don't forget about the 2.5 and 5G standards that are going to allow you to make better use of the installed CAT 5E and CAT 6 cabling. And that concludes my webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was an excellent presentation. Very informative. Really appreciate your time. At this time, we would like to address some questions that have been submitted. Um, just as a reminder, you can submit a question. You can continue to submit those questions through that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if we don't get to your question, a Graybar representative will follow up with you after the presentation. Uh, and then also, just as a reminder, one of the questions that came in was, uh, how do we get a copy of the slides? These will be posted, uh, so you can go back and, and listen again or share those uh, with uh, anyone that might want to listen again. Okay, so the first question I have, um, is Category 8 only for use in the data center, or will it be used yeah. in enterprise environments? Well, the primary reason why Category 8 is initially going to be limited to the data center is the 30-meter distance limitation and the two-connector channel limitation. Um, when you're talking about running cable out into the enterprise, 30 meters can be a very limiting factor. Second thing is the active equipment that's going to be coming onto the market that needs 25G and 40G is pretty much going to be data center switches and servers. Now, I'm not saying that CAD8 won't ever go into the enterprise. I just anticipate it won't be something that will be going to the desk probably for the next, you know, two, three, five years. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. Um, the next question is related to 6A field terminated plugs. So I have seen 6A field term plugs. Have you seen any newer version than those that became available late last year? Is Leviton working on a new plug for 6A? The 6A plug is something that we are investigating. One of the challenges, as I mentioned before, with a 6A field term plug is uh, the 
most of the ones that are available are the big metal bodies that make it easy to terminate. It's very similar to like a tool-free termination on a jack. But from an application standpoint, if you're going to use it on the end of your LAN cable and connect it into an access point or a camera or some other IP device, you're, you don't really have a lot of space for that type of cable or, or that type of plug. And when you're talking about shielded 6A, you, you add just a little bit more of a challenge in terms of getting it done the correct way. And then re-terminating a field term plug can be more of a challenge than re-terminating a jack. So for a variety of reasons, for, from an installer standpoint and uh, just ease of, of testing and terminating and knowing that you're going to get the job done right the first time, if possible, we do recommend the use of a jack, a jack-to-jack -jack permanent link, and then a patch cord. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. Okay, the next question is, is it possible to design systems for 2.5 or 5 gig over Category 6 for a more cost-effective solution? Again, it's, when we start talking about designing systems, uh, that typically implies pulling new cable. And the standard that IEEE is going to release is going to be very clear that it is for installed cabling. So we don't want to recommend that people will plan on pulling CAT6 cabling as a new installation and then being able to run 5G. If you're going to be in a position where you're going to have to pull new cable, CAT6A is the way to go for the higher bandwidth with rates as well as all the PoE capabilities that's available. Okay. The next question, does Leviton have a grid system office wiring design guide? We do not have that at this time. The, the grid system wiring design, I would point you to the TIA, uh, TSB, was the 184. Okay. Right. Um, the next question is, why not just attach a plug directly to the horizontal cable for WAP application, the BAP? Well, and that's, that, that kind of falls back on the other question. If you're talking about CAT6, that's something that could work well. Um, but in, in my experience, uh, the box cameras for the uh, IP cameras, where they uh, have the RJ45 that connects directly out the back is great, but a lot of your dome cameras just simply won't have the space available to accommodate a 6A plug. And, and okay, when you're perfect. talking about, yeah, so POE reasons as well as bandwidth reasons, uh, just you got to use caution when you're talking about a direct attach in the field 6A plug. All right, we've got time for one more question uh, before we need to go ahead and move toward wrapping it up. So this question is, um, we run 10, 10 gig over category six, but have no runs that are close to the link limitations. We chose not to go with category six A due to the cost and size of the cable. Um, I think it maybe is more of a comment actually. So. Yeah, and and the, the TSB 155 that TIA has published, that does allow for running 10 G over cat six A or 10G over CAT6, but again, you've got to be careful that you're not going to exceed, I think it's the 55 meters distance limitation, and then there's, uh, if you're following the letter of the TSB, you're, you're doing 100% alien crosstalk testing, which I know that most people aren't going to invest the time into that. So I, I guess the bottom line is both for the, the 10G over Cat six and then the new two and a half and five G. You just need to go into it eyes wide open. It'll probably work as long as you adhere to the uh, recommendations. But there may be a few outlier situations where you may run into some trouble. All right, great. Thank you, Mark. Well, at this point, we're just about out of time. Uh, again, if we didn't get to your question, the gray bar representative will follow up with you after the presentation. Uh, just as a reminder, this presentation will be archived on the graybar.com website. Again, we want to thank you for your time, and we hope you will join us again next month for Graybar's G2 Talk. Thank you.